Hi there, I welcome you to the second lecture on radiation protection part one. In this lecture, we will look at some of the radiation effects, which I have also discussed the same in radiobiology. Then we will move on to justify the use of radiation, look at the principles of radiation protection. And we will also look at the radiation dose limits provided by the ICRP 60, then ICRP 103 and look at the threshold doses for tissue reaction as per ICRU 118. And finally, we will discuss little on the radiation dose to embryo and fetus. How does radiation affect us? There are basically two things that could happen. One is it could alter the tissue function or it could stop the tissue function. It has been well accepted that the DNA is the principal target for biological effects of radiation, such as cell killing, carcinogenesis, and mutation. What is deoxyribonucleic acid, the DNA? One has to understand this to understand the radiation effects. DNA is a large molecule that has got a double helical structure, as you can see in this picture, has two strands held together by hydrogen bonds between the bases. Each strand consists of alternating sugar, deoxyribose, and phosphate groups. Attached to these are four bases, the sequence of which specifies the gen genetic code. Two of the bases are thymine and cytosine, single, drum, single ring group called pyrimidines. The other two are adenine and guanine, and they form the double ring group called purines. What does the ionizing radiation do? Ionizing radiation deposits energy that injures or destroys cells by damaging the genetic material, that is the DNA, making it impossible for these cells to continue to grow. As you can see in this picture, they come and damage the DNA. The damage to DNA, which is the critical target, can be by two different methods. One is called the direct action, the other one is called the indirect action. The atoms of the target itself may be ionized or excited, thus initiating the chain of events that leads to a biological damage called the direct action. The atoms of the target may be straight away ionized or excited. And that initiates a chain of events that leads to a biological damage, which is called the direct action. I will explain this little more in the next few slides. The atoms may interact with other atoms or molecules in the cell to produce free radicals that are able to diffuse far enough to reach and damage the critical target, that is the DNA. This is called the indirect action. Let us look at the direct action. Direct action occurs when radiation is absorbed by a molecule known to be critical to maintain the life of the DNA. The photon, as you can see in this picture animation, ejects an electron and the electron straight away goes and damages the DNA, produces a biological damage here. This is referred to as the direct action. Indirect action is one in which the radiation interacts with other molecules in the cell, most importantly, the water molecule. The products of this interaction may go and further interact with the DNA. Electrons produce highly reactive free radical which break the chemical bonds and produce chemical changes, thus the biological damage. You can see in this animation, so first the atom is ionized and they go and interact with water molecule and produce OH radical which in turn goes and damages the DNA. This is referred to as the indirect action. This is the dominant process for low NET radiation. About two-thirds of the biological damage by X-rays is caused by this indirect action, where an electron is ejected, which go and interact with water molecule, produces OH radical, free radical, and these free radicals go and damage the DNA. Radiation effect can be classified into two different ways. One is depending on the tissue that is getting, type of the tissue that is getting affected. The other one is depending on the type of effect that happens. In the first one, it is classified as somatic effect and hereditary effect, otherwise called the genetic effect. In somatic effect, the somatic cells, 
are affected, that means the health of the exposed individual is affected. In hereditary effect or genetic effect, it occurs in the descendants of the exposed individual, offsprings of the exposed individual, not the exposed individual itself, but it affects the offsprings. The other classification is stochastic effect and deterministic effect and recently ICRP has classified it as tissue reaction. It Originally it was called non-stochastic effect and later it became deterministic effect and now it is called tissue reaction. We will see both. Stochastic effect are effects for which the probability of an effect occurring rather than the severities is regarded as a function of the dose with no threshold. The probability of the effect depends on the dose and not the severity. Example is range of solid tumors as well as leukemia. Tissue reaction or those which become evident, evident after a large dose, there is a threshold below which the effects do not occur. For example, erythema, that is the reddening of the skin, one needs to get irradiated to 3 sievert to see that effect. If you go further into understand the stochastic effect, it pertains to random process. You know, you cannot say this will happen to this person. The same dose delivered, uh, given to different people will show different type of stoch stochastic effects. They may show, they may not show. So it pertains to a random process. It is not that a person exposed should certainly get it. There is no threshold. There is no minimum dose. Severity is independent of dose. So how severe there is, it's not depending on dose. Even a small dose can have a stochastic effect which could be serious. And the probability depends on the dose, not the severity. If the dose is increased, the chances of stochastic effect happening increases. And these are mostly late effects. And the best example is carcinogenesis and genetic effect. Some of the examples of stochastic effect, leukemia, it actually takes about 8 to 10 years, the atomic bomb casualties, and uh, bone cancer, 15 years, and it's a dial painters, thyroid cancer, somewhere between 15 and 30 years, atomic bomb casualties, lung cancer, 10 to 20 years, and mine workers. These values are not very, you know, accurate in the sense these are different books give slightly different values. So don't get worried if, I have different value in another place for the same type of uh, tumors. The deterministic effect, which is currently called tissue reaction, has a threshold. That effect will not happen unless a minimum dose is received, the threshold dose is received. And the severity depends on dose and not the probability. The more the dose, the effect becomes bad. And these are early effects. Example is cataract, erythema, epilation. Let us look at how high CRP has been uh, defining the terms that we are discussing today as stochastic and uh, tissue reaction. ICRP in its publication 9 in 1966 first discussed about the effects of radiation exposure falling into two general categories that are referred to as the tissue reaction and stochastic effects today that actually started in 1966. Then in its publication in 1977, a first evolution was introduced of the distinction between non-stochastic and stochastic effects to replace the acute and late categories. So the term non-stochastic and stochastic effect came in 1977. Subsequently in 1984, the distinction between early and late effects for non-stochastic effects were introduced. In ICRP publication 60, it started to provide two terms, definite terms. One is deterministic effect, the other one is stochastic effect. It replaced non-stochastic effect with deterministic effect. In its publication 103 in 2007, ICRP adopted the term tissue reaction to replace the deterministic effect or it allows us to use it as a synonym for deterministic effect. ICRP issued a statement in its publication 118, in which it has discussed about the tissue reactions. The revised recommendation issued in 2007 
include consideration of the detriment arising from non-cancer effects of radiation on health. These effects were originally called deterministic effects are now called a tissue re reaction. The reason for this is it is increasingly recognized that some of these effects are not determined at the time of radiation but can be modified after radiation exposure. The Commission has now re reviewed recent epidemiological evidence suggesting that there are some tissue reaction effects, particularly those with very late manifestation where threshold doses might be lower than previously thought. The threshold doses are much lower than what was originally thought. A typical example is the lens of the eye. The threshold in absorbed dose is now considered to be only 0.5 gray. Earlier we were talking about 2 gray. Now it is only 0.5 gray. The occupational exposure is in planned exposure situation. The commission now recommends an equivalent dose limit of for the lens of the eye of 20 millisievert per year averaged over a defined period of five years with no single year exceeding 50 millisievert. It looks very similar to the whole body dose limit. The next one is although uncertainty remains, medical practitioner, practitioner should be made aware that the absorbed dose threshold for circulatory disease may be as low as 0.5 gray to the heart and brain. This is another important thing. The dose, threshold dose could be as low as 0.5 gray for the circulatory disease. Doses of this magnitude to patient could be reached during some complex interventional, interventional procedures. Therefore, particular emphasis should be placed on optimizing these circumstances. The commission continues to recommend that optimization of protection be applied in all exposure situation and for all categories of exposure. The commission further actually emphasizes, emphasizes that protection should be optimized not only for whole body exposure, but for exposure to specific tissues, particularly the lens of the eye, the heart and cerebrovascular system. So this is a very important statement that ICRP has come up of late, that the threshold doses for circulatory system, the lens of the eye, Everything has been reduced and it recommends optimization in several procedures. Let us look at all this uh, optimization further when we discuss about radiation protection. So what these radiations can do? We discussed about various effects, carcinogenesis, non-cancerous effects, deterministic effect, now called a tissue reaction, everything. But what can they really do? One is when exposed to radiation, there are stochastic effects that include epithelium, that is cancer, bone or blood cancer, leukemia, gonad cancer, mutation, thyroid cancer, thyroid carcinogenesis, and fetus, which will become congenital defects. Some of the effects are cumulative, cells repair in most situations, DNA repair, cell cycle and checkpoints are there, but these are the effects that could happen. You know, this actually will be worrying for people who learn about radiation safety to start with. I will get cancer if I work with radiation. I will get, you know, uh, mutation to, uh, could happen in uh, exposure to gonads and uh, thyroid cancer can happen and uh, if fetus is exposed, congenital defects could be there. What are the type of exposure? Let us now go and look into ICRP recommendations further. The exposure as per ICRP are classified into three. One is occupational exposure. That is the exposure of a person to radiation mainly as a result of the work he performs. Because of his work, for example, a radiation technologist or a doctor or a radiation physicist who gets radiation because they work in a radiation area. Medical exposure, it is the radiation exposure of a person as part of a medical diagnosis or treatment. Either it could be radiotherapy or a CT scan or a chest x-ray. Any radiation received due to a medical procedure is referred to as the medical exposure. The third one is the public exposure. It is the exposure of a person by means other than occupational and medical. There is no reason for these two exposures because he is not working so he shouldn't get occupational exposure and didn't undergo any medical procedure but still uh, 
the person gets exposed then it's referred to as the public exposure icrp 60 has outlined three major principles of radiation protection one is justification the other one is optimization the third one is dose limit justification is the one where you have to justify the use of radiation that is the benefit should outweigh the risk optimization is where you have to optimize the procedure so that the dose is as low as reasonably achievable the third is dose limits that is a numerical limit set by icrp 60 should at no case be exceeded it is important that none of the principles should be used on their own an effective radiation protection system should use these principles three principles to ensure that all radiation doses are kept as low as possible let us do a risk analysis we learned that you the radiation exposure could result in stochastic effects which could be uh, leukemia or some cancer solid tumors it could lead to <coughs> mutations if gonads are exposed it could lead to congenital effects if fetus or fetus is exposed so we will do a risk analysis it is safe is it is there benefit in working with radiation as we said the benefit should outweigh the risk how does the risk of handling ionizing radiation sources compare with other risk in occupational areas like other industries is it as safe as other safe industries is the question let us look at other industries and look at how much is the death per million the chance of a death in one million in other industries there are interesting statistics they are a bit old but it's i think is a u.s statistics if somebody if people smoke 1.5 cigarettes a day there will be one death in a million if people drive 80 kilometer a car there could be one death in a million i'm sure this is much more in india if a person flies 420 kilometer there could be one death in a million and you know that flying is the safest mode of travel two weeks of work in a factory could result in one death in a million 20 minutes just living as a 60 year old i belong to this category there could be one death in a million nine hours as a 30 year old there could be just living could result in one death in a million and there are other things that could also result in one death in a million for example 90 second rock climbing could result in one death in a million eating just 500 grams of peanut butter i do eat a lot of that could result in one death in a million and eating 100 barbecue sticks could result in one death in a million and see a getting exposure of 0.02 millisievert acute ionizing radiation could result in one death in a million you know, this actually compares with very nearly a safe industry limit that comparison with uh, barbecue steaks and uh, peanut butter or for fun to keep you all awake let us do a serious comparison let us compare radiation industry with other safe industries for example trade where there will be 40 deaths per million in a year manufacturing there is about 60 deaths per million in a year service and government where there are 40 or 90 deaths respectively per million in a year which compares to safe industries and if a person is exposed to if a million people are exposed to 2 millisievert per year which is something similar to what you see here with safe industries the risk industries are transport construction mines and agriculture where the number of deaths are much much more than what you see in safe industries and also see in a radiation industry so now we are satisfied that radiation industry is much safer safer than even eating peanut butter 500 grams of peanut butter safer than so many other things let us look at the basis for exposure limits icrp has clearly said there are exposure limits and no one should at any cost exceed the exposure limit but how these exposure limits evolved with time 
it has changed with time. ICRP has been changing the exposure limits depending on the information available, biological information available and also on social philosophy and the ability to control the exposure. So these are the three reasons the, with which they keep changing their dose limits. If you really look at the biological information, what they had earlier and what they have now, the genetic risk have been now are smaller than what they thought earlier in the 1950s. Originally, the tissue weighting factor for gonads were 0.2. Now it has been reduced to 0.08. Similarly, carcinogenic risk are larger than they thought in the 1950s. ICRP has provided individual dose limits. It clearly recommends that the exposure of any individual should be subject to dose limits. And the dose limits are based on the following criteria. Number one, no unacceptable risk if a person receives the dose limit. Prevention of deterministic effect. That means there is no chance of getting any tissue reactions, which obviously means the dose limit is much lower than the threshold doses of any of the tissue reactions. Minimization of stochastic effect. There is no minimum dose for stochastic effect. Therefore, if a person receives the dose limit, the chances of stochastic effects is negligible. ICRP 60 has provided the annual dose limits. The annual dose limit for whole body for radiation worker is 50 millisievert per year but with a rider. And for public it is 1 millisievert. I will tell you what the rider is later. For lens of the eye, it is 150 millisievert per year and 15 millisievert per year for the member of the public. For skin, for radiation worker, for it is 500 millisievert a year and for member of the public, it is 50 millisievert per year. For hands and feet, it is 500 millisievert per year for radiation worker and for member of the public, it is 50 millisievert per year. So if you look at all these, for the member of the public, it is one tenth of the radiation worker except for the whole body. For pregnancy, once declared, it is 2 millisievert to the lower trunk. This has been changed in the next ICRP publication. The whole body dose limit is 50 millisievert for radiation worker, as it is said here, in a single year and 20 millisievert a year when averaged over 5 years. Now, this is the rider I said, which means in 5 year period, one cannot exceed 100 millisievert. And no occupational exposure should be permitted until the age of 18 years, which means nobody can be radiation worker until he becomes 18. For lens of eye, the new limit is 20 millisievert per year, averaged over five consecutive years, and 50 millisievert in a single year, which is very similar to the whole body dose. NCRP includes a lifetime effective dose of 10 millisievert times the age, which means if somebody is 60, then the lifetime effective dose is 60 into 10 millisievert. Let us now do a comparison and see how the dose limits has evolved with various ICRP reports. The occupational dose from ICRP 26 was 50 millisievert per year. ICRP 60 came with 20 millisievert per year, averaged over a period of five years and 50 millisievert in any single year. ICRP 103 kept this as the same. For public, ICRP 26 had 5 millisievert per year and ICRP 60 had 1 millisievert per year but allowed a higher value for special circumstances but said 5 year average should not exceed 1 millisievert. ICRP 103 also kept the same limit but for fetal, fetal dose from the declaration of pregnancy ICRP 26 had 15 millisievert, but ICRP 60 had 2 millisievert to the surface of the abdomen for a remainder of pregnancy, but ICRP 103 has changed it to 1 millisievert to the embryo or fetus. This is something like assuming the embryo or fetus as a public. So it goes to a same value as that of a dose to public. For medical caregivers, the medical exposure, no limit, constraints considered, no value suggested, but ICRP 103 includes 5 millisievert per episode or 20 millisievert, that is 2 rem per year maximum constraint. 
For worker, it is 150 millisievert to the lens and 500 millisievert to the scale over one centimeter square and 500 millisievert to the hands and feet. ICRP 103 also has almost the same value. For public, it has got 50 millisievert per ICRP 26 for organ dose and ICRP 60 has 50 millisievert over one centimeter square and that is also kept the same in ICRP 103. Annual dose limits as per AERB is slightly different. The whole body dose is 30 millisievert in a single year, but 20 millisievert when averaged over a period of five years. It is not 50 as given by ICRP. Atomic Energy Regulatory Board has reduced it. And lens of the eye is 150 millisievert, skin is 500 millisievert, hands and feet 500, and pregnancy is still kept as two millisievert to the lower trunk. ICRP has provided threshold doses for tissue reaction in a radiation protection context. For various tissue reactions, it has given the threshold dose both for acute radiation as well as for chronic or protracted irradiation. We will look at some of them. For example, for depression of hematopoiesis, the threshold dose is 0.5 gray for acute dose and 0.4 gray for chronic or protracted. For mortality, the acute dose threshold is 1 gray for chronic or protracted radiation, 10 to 14 gray accumulated for one to three months are likely to be tolerated. One of the important thing is uh, radiation induced eye contract or minor lens opacities for both acute and chronic radiation, the threshold dose is 0.5 gray. Intestinal radiation early mortality in six to nine, gray, nine days is six gray. Circulatory disease, both cardiovascular disease as far as cerebrovascular disease for both acute and chronic the threshold dose is 0.5 gray. Similarly for necrosis of femoral heads and rib fractures the threshold dose is 50 gray in 2 gray per fraction for a chronic and protracted radiation. For skeletal muscle it is 55 gray in 2 gray per fraction. For growing bone is much more radiosensitive and therefore it is 25 gray and 2 gray per fraction. Uh, symptomatic spinal cord injury is the, for chronic and protracted it is 50 gray at 2 gray per fraction. Adult brain necrosis less than 10 gray. Developing brain of children can cause long term cognitive and behavioral defects at 1 to 2 gray for chronic and protracted radiation. Infants before 18 months of age are even more susceptible with cognitive impairment in adult life with just 0.1 gray. So these are the threshold doses for the tissue reactions which is outlined in ICRP 118. ICRP in its publication 118 has indicated the threshold doses for tissue reaction which are different from publication 103. Particularly with reference to eye. The threshold dose for radiation induced eye cataract is now considered to be approximately 0.5 gray for both acute and fractionated exposure. And it was also given for circulatory disease, which has now been recognized as an important late effect for radiation exposure, both for mortality and morbidity. An approximate threshold dose of 0.5 gray has been proposed for acute and fractionated protracted exposures. This is done on the basis that this might lead to an incidence of or at the order of 1% of circulatory disease in exposed individuals. The threshold dose values for chronic exposure depend on the exposure duration and the follow up period after exposure. I would like to bring in some of the comments on radiation to embryo and fetus. Fetus or embryo is more sensitive to ionizing radiation than adult human. There has been increased incidence of spontaneous abortion few days after conception because of radiation. There has also been increased incident, incidence of mental retardation, microcephaly, that is the small head size, especially 8 to 15 weeks after conception, and malformations, particularly skeletal, stunt growth or genital, higher risk of cancer, particularly chances of leukemia, both in childhood and in later life. 
It is extremely important to ascertain before any procedure using ionization radiation that the female patient is pregnant or not. Almost always, if a diagnostic radiology examination is medically indicated, the risk to the mother of not doing the procedure is greater than the risk of the potential harm to the embryo or fetus. This means the risk to the mother in not doing the procedure should be higher than the risk due to radiation on the embryo or fetus. Then only this diagnostic procedure is justified. Prenatal doses from most correctly performed diagnostic procedure present no measurably increased risk of prenatal or postnatal death. Developmental damage including malformation or men impairment of mental development over the background incidence of these entities. Lifetime cancer risk following in utero exposure is assumed to be similar to that following radiation in childhood. So radiation in in utero exposure is assumed to be very similar to the radiation in childhood. So when do you suggest termination of pregnancy if a pregnant lady has to be exposed or is exposed to radiation? This is a very difficult question to answer. Termination of pregnancy owing to radiation exposure is an individual decision. We are not supposed to make the decision. The individual has to take the decision, which will be affected by many factors. Absorbed dose below 100 mg to embryo or fetus should not be considered as a reason or an indication for termination pregnancy due to radiation. This is an important thing. At embryo, embryonic or fetal doses above this level, the pregnant patient should receive sufficient information to be able to make informed decision. The decision should be made by the patient and should be give, provided sufficient information for her to make a decision on whether abortion should be done or not. It will also depend on the individual circumstances, the magnitude of the estimated embryonic or fetal dose, consequent risks of serious harm to the developing embryo or fetus, the risk of cancer in the later life. All this information should be adequately provided so that the individual can make a decision on termination of pregnancy. Radiotherapy during pregnancy is another question which radiation oncology physicists most often will have to answer. It is essential to ascertain that whether a female patient is pregnant prior to radiation therapy and some abdominal interventional procedures. In pregnant patients, cancers that are remote from the pelvis can usually be treated with radiation therapy. However, please note, you have to note, give a very good attention in treatment planning so that the dose to embryo fetus is much lower. It is expected that the radiation dose to embryo fetus, including the scattered component, is estimated and provided for verification. Cancers in the pelvis can rarely be adequately treated with radiation therapy during pregnancy without severe or lethal consequences to embryo and fetus. So if it is in the pelvis region, it is impossible to treat adequately without giving any severe or lethal consequence dose to embryo or fetus. Thank you very much for your patient listening.